<laughs> but not in a pervy way. Uh, Chris will be disappointed. Anyway, um, we're going uh, to be talking about pointers and interactions, a uh, topic which is very close to my heart. Sounds like a pointers and inter interactions. Sounds like a dating website, doesn't it? Anyway, so um, I'm going to start this by just introducing the, uh, the, the panel. We've got the, over here, the lovely Patrick Lauka. Do I always get, I always get that name wrong. Have I got that name wrong? Patrick Lauka? That'll do. Uh, York Tangdella at the end there. Uh, York is uh, author of Hammer.js, which is a, a library that I used very recently. It's wonderful uh, for kind of dealing with touch events uh, and now pointer events as well, more recently. Uh, he builds mobile apps for, uh, for a living, uh, loves to experiment with new techniques. Uh, Patrick, you know, I didn't tell you what you actually did. You uh, used to work for Opera, didn't you? Um, being a DevRel guy, yeah. But he's now an accessibility consultant at Piccolo and member of the Pointer Events Working Group and WC3 uh, Touch Events uh, Community Group. Um, we have Pete Smart over here. Pete, uh, very much UX focused, and he's done a lot of incredible work with Viz Cities recently with his uh, uh, partner. partner yeah, I was going to say partner, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> uh, not partner. Um, Rob Hawks, incredible 3D visualizations, you should absolutely ch check it out. And uh, he's also the uh, author of 50 Problems in 50 Days, which describes my last 50 days <laughs> organizing th this, this portion of the event. Um, and then finally, we have the wonderful Steve Workman. Um, I've known Steve for an awful long time and uh, incredible kind of web developer. Uh, it's a very insightful young man, I find. Um, so next, I'm going to pass over to Rick Byers. Want to yeah. introduce me first? Or? No. no, I don't need it. OK. Rick awesome. Byers is uh, from Google. <laughs> He's a wonderful man. <laughs> and um, he's going to be talking about uh, uh, points and interactions. Thank you very much, Rick. Thanks. Let me just... Uh, let me just get my slides displaying here. Sorry about this. Okay. Yeah, we do that on purpose. Sorry. Yeah. Let's do this. All right. So, so I'm here to talk about pointers and interactions. Um, to me, this is about how, how do we evolve input on the web? First of all, how, how, like, even just looking backwards and saying, how do we catch up to native mobile? I think there's a lot of ways in that input is better on, on native today um, that we really need to catch up on on the web, but also looking forward and saying, what are the things that are coming and how can we prepare the web to make sure we're ready for all sorts of new ways of interacting with, with content and applications? So I'm going to talk about this kind of from my biased view on the Chrome team. Um, for, uh, talk, going to talk about the, the ways in which we kind of classify the problems and, and in the priority that we're kind of thinking about it so that you all can tell me I'm stupid and, and that I should reprioritize. But first and foremost, this probably comes as no surprise, our top priority on our team is performance. Um, if, if your site doesn't perform well to your input, if it doesn't stick to your finger, um, if it doesn't, uh, you know, if things don't respond immediately when you touch them, um, or, or even on a laptop, if, if things are janky when you're scrolling, that's a real problem for user engagement. So this has got to be the top priority. But we've also got a big problem with richness. Uh, today, it's possible to build really rich, uh, interactive user interfaces. And frankly, it's, it's easier to do that on, on other platforms. We've got some problems on the web where certain types of UI are really hard to do well without like, re-implementing re all sorts of browser features yourself. And last but not least, we've also got a problem with rationality. And this is just the idea of the pit of success, the idea that the obvious thing should really ideally be the, the, uh, the correct thing most of the time. And you don't want to have a million different foot guns where every time you try to do something that seems obvious, you shoot yourself in the foot and something breaks. And like I said, I think we're not here on the web for any of these things yet. I think we've got to fix all of this. Um, but what's, what's really worse is that there's these trade-offs between them. And we keep dancing around. And for example, over the last couple of years with all the folks on mobile, I think we've, we've really put a lot of emphasis on performance. And I think we've lost some richness and rationality in the result as a result by not focusing on it at the same time. So I'm going to go and I'm going to talk about three, a big problem for each of these areas um, and just kind of talk about how it's affected performance, richness, and rationality. So first one's been talked a lot to death. I'm not going to spend too long on it, but obviously touch latency is definitely too high, right? The, on, on a touch device, 
we're trying to present a physical illusion that you're f manipulating a physical object. And that, uh, as soon as the latency goes up, so it's not sticking to your finger, or if it's variable latency, if you've got latency jank, then, then it destroys that illusion. And, th and that's a real problem. Um, it really causes engagement to collapse. And, and there's been a ton of improvements here over the last uh, you know, several years. Probably the biggest architectural change to the platform, even though it's not exposed to the apps, is that most browsers now will, will scroll on a completely separate thread to try to insulate the scrolling from what else is happening in the browser. There's been a ton of talk about the 300 millisecond click delay. And I'm, you know, we've kind of talked that to death, but the one thing I'm most excited about here is we've just got, uh, now, we now have a standard way of turning off the click delay on individual parts of the page without turning off anything else. You just turn off double tap zoom. And we've got a new CSS property called touch action that's shipping in Chrome 35. Firefox is gonna have it soon. Touch action does much more than this, but this is one of the things I'm excited about that touch action lets you do. Um, and, and we continually, we continuously have been making tooling better. Uh, I think we still have a long way to go. Um, on my team, we've been working, for example, on trying to accurately correlate input to painting. It's not good enough to just look at your timeline view and say, oh, I'm getting stuff at 60 frames a second if that painting is like happening like a second behind when the input came in. Um, and so we've done a lot of work to plumb latency tracking data down through Chrome, all the way from the input events coming in from a kernel down to when we tell the GPU, hey, we want to display this. Um, and I'm hoping that eventually we'll get that exposed in a more friendly way through, uh, through DevTools. Um, but for now, it's there in Chrome Tracing if anyone wants to play with it. Um, so then in terms of richness, the biggest, this, is, this is where I'm starting to focus a lot more. I think we've neglected this space for, for a long time. And this is, um, as we've done all these fast paths, we've, we've taken control away from developers in the name of performance. And, and frankly, I think when, you, when we look at it really closely, it's not necessary. There's ways that we can give developers control, um, but still maintain high performance, or at least high performance by default. And, and one of the, and this comes back to the extensible web manifesto that I think's been mentioned before, right? The idea that as a community, we're never gonna evolve the web to be the platform that we want it to be, to, to compete with all of our other platforms if, if we keep kind of spending years focusing on these high-level features and trying to agree between browsers and the high-level features. Instead, I think we really need to focus on what are the core primitives? What's the kernel that we want to expo that all browsers are going to expose so that we can enable jQuery and different frameworks and all of you to innovate like crazy and try new things without having to wait for the kind of long, drawn-out standards process and agreements between all the browser vendors. So one of the things that really bothers me here is scrolling is so critical, and this experience of scrolling is so critical, but if you want to customize it, for example, there's a great library called iScroll that customizes scrolling in various ways. You've got to re-implement everything yourself that the browser was already doing, and you're, you're prevented from, from doing what the browser is doing. You don't have access to this separate thread I was telling you about, so everything's going to be blocked on your main thread. It's going to make it jankier. Uh, you, you, depending on the browser, you may not have access to the pr precise physical pixel locations of where the user's finger is, because on, most, on mobile devices anyway, uh, one CSS pixel is more than one hardware pixel, and only the browser knows in many cases where exactly the input or the scroll offsets are. Um, and, and you might also not have accurate, as accurate information about velocity that the browser has. And I think we need to fix all these like, low-level primitives so that somebody like iScroll can go and build scrolling that's just as good as what the browser does with some additional features. Um, even more immediately than that, there's a whole bunch of UIs that are, are becoming really popular. Um, you know, effects like pull to refresh, where when we've made these trade-offs in the browsers and we've said, you know, scrolling performance over all else, whoops, sorry. I guess that means I'm talking too long on this slide. Um, scrolling performance of over all else uh, me means that um, uh, it me means that we, we've taken control away from you. You can't say, well, I want to scroll, but now I want to switch to drawing my own little you know, custom effect that has different physics than what the scroll normally has. And I want to keep that lockstep with the scroll that's happening. And I want you to tell me when the user lifts their finger so I can change that effect. Um, similarly, uh, IE has a great, Microsoft has uh, the snap points feature in IE that, that is a great feature, but I'd love to, like, we should be talking about how do we enable the web so that people can innovate on features like that without always having to come to the browser, always having to, like, add every new UI feature at the top level of the browser. And, and one of the ones that really bothers me here is scroll synchronization, right? When we said if scrolling's happening on another thread, um, it's a problem for rationality because you're not used to having to reason about multi-threaded behavior in your UI. Um, but it's also a problem for richness and the kind of UIs you want to present. Everything from on a, a mobile app, you never see checkerboarding, right? Why, why does a web page always have to have checkerboarding? Maybe for your app, you might want to trade off and say, you know what, I don't want checker, I would rather have scroll jank than checkerboarding. Or I, I would rather have the ability to have perfect parallax where things are uh, updating exactly with the scroll position rather than doing the scroll asynchronously to 
those sorts of things. And I think it's been naive of us as browser vendors to say, we know the best default for all scenarios. We, we're going to trade off performance and richness for you um, and not give you any say in the matter. I think, I think we really got to start giving control of that to developers. Um, and also, how exactly should touch behave while scrolling? We, we're making a big change here to this in Chrome 35. I won't go into the details now, but you can read all about it. Um, but all this is, you know, in Chrome, we send, a, we send it, as soon as you start scrolling, we stop sending you events entirely. And that's terrible for richness. You, it means you can't build UIs like pull to refresh. OK, now for, in terms of rationality, one of the um, topics near and dear to my heart that people bring up a lot is why should we have to build, why should we have to write different UIs for different types of input? We should be able to make it easy to have a st single set of APIs that work for all sorts of different types of input. IE has an API called Pointer Events that you've probably heard about. Uh, we've been working on standardizing it for a long time. Um, and uh, you know, when we should be talking, is this the API that we want the entire web to move to? Um, and how, if we're you know, in doing things like that, how are we going to make it so that when we're exposing these low-level input APIs to web developers, how do we make sure that they're thinking at a high enough level of abstraction that their sites are still accessible? That they're not just targeting, you know, well, this, per you know, I got to worry about mouse and touch screen, but you know, we want people to be thinking about screen readers and all sorts of assistive technology as well. And then looking further out, there's all these exciting types of input on the horizon. You know, even, even you know, kind of old school stuff like directional pads on TVs, the web doesn't handle very well. But uh, you know, Microsoft has Perceptive Pixel, these gigantic touch screens where you can have multiple people touching them at once and track 100 different touch points. You know, how, how should the web interact with that? Or what if you've got multiple users, each with their own Wii remote, you know, interacting with a web page? You know, voice input, uh, depth cameras, um, Google Glass heads-up displays, um, touch screens like the Galaxy uh, S4 that can measure can tell when your finger's above the screen, right? Um, haptics, like what if your touch screens can start to give you physical feedback? And, and all these, what worries me is if we block all of these new technologies on, let's wait until we have a consensus. Let's wait until we can all agree in standards bodies how this should be exposed to the web. We've got a chicken and egg problem. We're never going to innovate. And so we need to be talking about how do we, what, what else is next and how do we prepare the web so that we can innovate um, without having to have consensus first, really. And part of this is just discussion. That's what Edge is all about. I'm looking forward to this discussion. But there's also plenty of places online that we should be discussing this. We've just spun up the Touch Events Community Group, which is a, a group within the W3C for people that are having have questions or issues with Touch Events and want to see Touch Events get improved. Um, and of course, we're always interested in specific bugs on Chrome. That's it. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. I thought I was going to hit you over the head with that bottle. To <laughs> was I? I'm really sorry for that introduction. I should explain to my... <laughs> that was fine. The reason I didn't really give you a very good introduction is because I wrote it by hand, and when I got up here, I couldn't read it. Uh, <laughs> Eric is uh, an engineer working on touchscreen support in Chrome. He's a member of the Pointers Events Working Group and the Touch Events Community Group. Just to clear that one up. Um, so first up, we have um, someone like Andrew Betts with a question. Is Andrew there? So web apps that use touch gestures can have problems with iframes swallowing touch events. Is the web developer hamstrung by their inability to exert complete control over user interaction in ways that native app developers can? Yeah, because I guess we do give over a lot of power to third-party control, third-party websites and iframes to uh, the browser. What, does, what do people think about that kind of thing? giving over that control? Should developers have more control? Start with maybe Patrick. It's, it's, it's a difficult one. Developers will always want more control, uh, be it with CSS stuff. You know, I want to control exactly how my users will experience the content I'm creating. And the same way with, with inputs as well, so output and input. There is an argument to be made that at certain points we should limit what, uh, what the developer can do so they don't completely mess up the uh, the, the conventions of the platform, for instance, uh, that you don't want every single website to just behave in a slightly different way and the user has to relearn it just because the developer thought, A, this is really cool, I can do you know, scroll jacking, but you know, now extending it to touch gestures and everything else as well. There should be some kind of, of convention. But on the other hand, uh, the topic we, we touched on at the start, touched on, uh, uh, is that uh, there'll be a lot of these cheap laughs, <laughs> I promise. Uh, <laughs> Is, is that, yeah, we do want to innovate, so we can't at the same time also say, well, we as, uh, I'll say we, even though I'm not in that fold anymore, we as browser developers know what's best, uh, what's the best interaction model. 
developers will want to experiment with new things. So it's, it's trying to strike the balance, but there will be situations where, probably for security reasons, uh, you don't want to have websites that completely take over the interface and start showing things that you know, the user thinks they're doing one thing, but it's actually doing something else in the background. It's a, it's a tough balancing act to make, I would say. Yorick, I mean, you're, you're developing Hammer. You, do you want to give more control to developers? Uh, how, how, does, how does that work? Yeah, that? I would like to see, a, I think, a lower level API. Like, it gets, um, when, when there's something, uh, when a new device comes up, like the Mayo or the, of the Wii modes, I, ju I just want uh, to, to, to get that information uh, in my browser. Mm -hmm. so, so I can build my own caches and, and, and don't have to wait for like uh, four, four years or something. It's mm -hmm. really long. But when it uh, arrives in the browser and for everyone. So, yeah. So I'm obviously a huge fan of, of giving developers more control, but you know, to play devil's advocate, the, the topic, the Met scenario they mentioned in this question was about iframes. And we actually, I think it's fixed in all our stable releases now, so I can mention we had a security bug in Chrome for a while, actually quite a long while, where um, you know, the touch of an API will tell you what other fingers are currently down. And so it was actually possible for an ad or something running in an iframe, if you touched on it, to receive information about where your other fingers were. Um, and, and that was a potential leak of privacy and a, and a security concern. And, and security is kind of the thing that, you know, I'm saying we shouldn't focus as much on performance and we should be you know, try to maintain our performance, but but get, uh, give the developer more control. Security is the thing that trumps all of that, mm. right? The web fails if we c if the users don't have confidence in it. It's the unique strength of the web. Well, you took the opinion there that um, with 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 gestures that you should be giving developers kind of more control. You said that in the talk as well. You want to be giving lower like, APIs. What are your thoughts, Pete, in terms of a in terms of the UX around uh, web design and web development? Do you think we should? Is there a benefit to be had? for gestures which are universally across an operating system, across a, a device. Um, is there a reason why developers maybe shouldn't be allowed to play around and fiddle around yeah. with interactions? Interesting. Um, so the conversations that I have uh, with developers um, uh, often go like this. Hey, guys, it'd be great if we could come up with this really innovative new feature. Why don't we try uh, you know, scroll jacking, for example? Why don't we go into that kind of realm and see what's possible with it and how we can kind of surprise the user uh, and get them to kind of I don't know, reconsider the, the experience that they're, they're looking at. But I think the, the, common, the common response that I get is that we don't want to kind of override the, the natural default of the browser. Yeah, we don't want to confuse people. <coughs> and I actually, after many arguments, I would probably side with the developers on this particular front. I think that uh, although I, as a, as a user experience designer, I want to innovate, I want to create <coughs> experiences which people find themselves immersed in, surprised by, and excited by, I think there, there must be conventions which exist across, across different platforms, across different browsers, which are therefore expected because not everyone wants to be surprised uh, and not everyone wants to have this kind of immersive experience. Most importantly, people don't want to be confused and I think that is the kind of the, the, the bedrock, really. I think part of the reason the developers respond in that way is all too often they can't do the one little thing you want to do without re-implementing like the fling physics or something. And this, to me, this represents a, a, a fundamental lack of layering in our platform, right? And many other platforms, for example, I know on Android, right, you can you know, replace little classes or hook into the process and not have to re-implement everything yourself. So you can get the native look and feel, but also customize it slightly. Mm. Um, and I think we failed at that in the web. Interesting. I think one, one good example where potentially there has been some improvement, just with some little personal experiments maybe, um, is, I don't know if you guys experienced this, but you're scrolling through a web page and you suddenly get to a full screen Google map, okay, and you're on your phone. And suddenly you're, you're no longer scrolling the page and you're suddenly inside the map. Uh, and that's a, a, an area which we've tried to innovate in. And we've tried to come up with a kind of a, a, a hack around that which allows you to kind of declare when you would like to interact with the map and actually when you are still scrolling. And I think there should be space to kind of al to allow <coughs> developers, designers to innovate in those areas and try and break away from the iframe kind of suction of doom that you go into. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there's got to be a limit. I think convention is also really important. You're quite a good uh, mixed bag of dev and design. <coughs> what's, what's your thoughts? So. Um, with, uh, with things going into, uh, uh, with all our touch events going into iframes, uh, one of my concerns is, is if I were to make, say, a web component, talked about today, uh, if I was that web component developer, I would obviously want all the touches to be sucked into uh, uh, to what I was doing. Because uh, I am always, uh, I've said, okay, I really know what this component needs to do, so uh, I should have control at this point. Why are, why are you trying to do the, the rest of the thing? And the more this goes on with web components and with other, um, other areas, advertising, of course, uh, iframes, maps is, great, is, a, is a great example. The more this happens, 
the, uh, the more important that actually having that kind of override is going to be so that when you do, as a developer, know better, and quite often you do know better, then you, uh, then you can override that and you can actually make a, a difference to the web application and improve the user experience. Andrew, have you have still got the mic? What's your thoughts on this? Has anyone got, thought, anyone got any thoughts on this? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, the front row, sorry. I'll let other people go. Because you look like you were doing something else there, Andrew. I, I know, I was <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> so it's kind of touching on your point, and you actually keep pointing it right at the end. The idea is actually a lot of times the interface, the developer who's building it knows best. And for example, your tangible example about like the Google Maps, we actually implement the exact same thing as a responsive website, there's a big old map. But, but what we did is actually once you went into the, kind of the mobile layer and snapped downwards, we actually changed the Google Maps, so it's no longer draggable. The interface gets changed, it's now double tap or zoom. Um, but I think that would only know, you can only really do that at the kind of developer level. You can't really do that automatically, I think, in the browser. There's too many assumptions because there could be other pointers where, you know, I don't want that to happen for whatever reason. You maybe would want an immersive experience. So I think there's, there's an onus on the developer making it to make decisions like that. Absolutely, you have to design around what, uh, what you're doing. So uh, a while back I did the uh, Met, Office web, uh, Met Office Weather Observation website um, and the, the mobile view for that. And most of that is a, a big Google map. And the really important thing was on the different browser sizes, actually giving you space for your fingers down the sides of the map so that you could still interact with the map, but you could also still get out. Because okay. otherwise, you're just actually, literally, you are stuck. So, okay, that's cool. Um, let's, next question, we've got um, Andres Brovens. Yes. Oh, at the front here. A nice, simple mic run there. Um, just a question about uh, gestures. Uh, is there a case for custom gestures that users would be unfamiliar with rather than standardizing a set of gestures that are semantically well understood? Well, your, your library's a lot about gestures. What do you think? Um, yeah, it's, you should. Uh, you, you, I guess you, you should be, be able to, to write custom gestures, but it also makes sense to just uh, use the system default gestures because the, the user is expecting like you can swipe and it acts the same on, on that page like the other page. But if the, if you want to write a custom gesture like uh, swipe with a weird, weird thing, or an, I don't know. It, you, 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 you still should be, should be able to uh, handle those things. It's, it's a really hard, writing gestures is really hard. It's really I mean, complex. I've not done it so much with touch, but definitely with things like connect, trying to understand what someone's doing and how it follows through, especially if it's a complex thing. It's really, really complicated mm -hmm. to do. And it's maybe not for the uninitiated. Is, is, is that your experience? Um, it can be complex, yeah. I mean, we, we, what we often find is that the UX is actually harder than the engineering. That coming yeah. up, you know, we, we actually had a bunch of fancy gestures, uh, touch gestures, when we first introduced the Chromebook Pixel. And we put a bunch of work into the engineering, but what was, users didn't know about them. They were hard to discover. You know, it was hard to train people to use them. And ultimately, we said we should just stick with the simple things. That said, I think it's essential we, we can't innovate, right? We're never going to come up with what the new interaction modes are unless we mm. give people the power. There's going to be some, you know, the next viral app that's going to have some cool thing that you do in your game to, to make it do something different. You know, it's going to become a standard. So you've got to give the power. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting point, but are developers the, necessarily the best people to make decisions about gestures? Generally, they're probably not. And if you give people really, <laughs> I don't mean to be offending, offending anyone, but I am a developer myself, so I, I you know, I think that, it's very difficult to write gestures which are which are well understood across the system. Mm. What do you think? I mean, it, it's, it's definitely a, more of a UX question, I would say, because uh, from the technology point of view, I mean, uh, not in pointer events as such, if we talk specifically about the uh, Microsoft implementation, but there is uh, a separate part that Microsoft has in, in IE that isn't uh, specced at the W3C, which is all about the gestures and uh, how to actually write programmatically what a gesture is, picking out, say, two fingers that you've put on the screen and, and then following any changes between them, the angle, etc. So technically, uh, I think that that is not an issue. We can and, and we do with, with uh, also with libraries like Hammer write our own gesture code. And it really is more uh, a case of are there standards? I mean, Luke W has documented a lot of the uh, uh, standard gestures that you get on a variety of platforms. There are you know, similarities, but also quite <coughs> fundamental differences in some cases. If you go from iOS to Android, for instance, there are a lot of uh, you know, pinch zoom, that kind of stuff. Nowadays, we know about it. It's become common knowledge. But when it was first introduced, you know, nobody 
had that, that understanding that that is there. So UX wise, there is the, the argument of how do you teach your users to that there are gestures, how do you hint at gestures without doing a big, before you can use the app, here's a 10 minute tutorial on you know, how you move, how you shoot, how you go into your inventory kind of stuff. It's, it, it's more of a softer issue, I would say. So from the technical point of view, uh, gestures are here. We can create gestures, we can hijack pointers, we can hijack finger movements. Uh, but should we is usually more the fundamental question. Mm -hmm. Steve, I know you're quite involved in the London sort of web standards, uh, sort of meetups and groups. Do you think we need more standardization <coughs> in, in this whole world of, of suggestions? There's an awful lot of proprietary technology in, in, in this. Is, is there maybe room for more collaboration? I think so, definitely. So um, there's a lot of work going on in the different standards organizations and kind of different routes going through this. Um, obviously, Microsoft's. Uh, implementation is uh, is one. Uh, another is one from uh, one from Apple, so who we haven't talked about enough yet today. Um, <coughs> who are doing this uh, spec called I think it's Mondo UI. Is uh, the we talked about it last night. Indie UI. Indie oh, UI. Indie That's UI it. Spec. So, uh, which uh, is not a gesture thing in you know, specifically but relates to actually system-wide commands. So like uh, if you were to do undo, it would also uh, trigger an undo kind of action or a named undo a action throughout uh, the web as well. And uh, that kind of thing also, uh, also then expands into gestures at the same time. So uh, Apple is going a completely different way of this uh, from Microsoft um, and uh, uh, in the end, these people need to talk, uh, talk to each other and we need to stand, uh, standardize uh, something like this. Otherwise, we are going to get two completely different implementations that are <coughs> probably going to be incompatible with each other. Mm. But is there a case for custom, custom gestures? Uh, I would say definitely yes. Uh, I would say that, uh, especially when you, start, you stop considering kind of traditional kind of uh, point and click interfaces and touch interfaces and start thinking about uh, kind of some of the new uh, input devices that are coming onto the market at the moment, things like the Mayo, um, which is, uh, it kind of reads the electronic signals in your arm, for example. Uh, things like the Leap Motion, uh, when you're in interacting in 3D space. I think these give us fantastic opportunities to start exploring custom gestures. Um, some of the work that I've been doing uh, with the very talented Rob Hawks, who should probably be sat here rather than me, um, uh, are looking at how to do gestures in 3D space. And you can't just simply kind of recreate, you know, touch gestures in those spaces where we're trying to create, you know, three, 3D cities. Sim City for real life. Um, but what we're trying to look at is how you, how you extrapolate out a city and how you kind of break it down and, and see different parts. So we're talking about gestures like this, where you're able to pull, pull apart things, like being able to pull apart a watch, that famous diagram that we all see. Um, and I think there's a real case for looking at, uh, especially as we start to look at new forms of input, to look at uh, gestures which are more suited um, rather than kind of replicating the two-dimensional gestures that we have now. Give developers power, <coughs> standardize more, talk more. So next topic. We are, uh, I've got Rashaba uh, written down. Don't have a second name, so. Yeah, hi. Uh, so my question is about, uh, say, uh, browsing the web on devices like Google Glass or <coughs> Moto 360, the watch, is a very different experience. As they do not have the traditional methods of input, how do we develop or adapt our web pages to better support such devices? Would a device information API be a, good, be a good idea? You were talking about new devices. I was talking about new devices. Well, I think I, I would I would come at that question from a from a high, a high level. I guess I'm sure these guys will maybe talk, talk about the technicalities, but. I would probably start with, the, with, for me, what's the most important thing is, is the user need or the task that that particular person is trying to achieve on the device that they are using. Um, uh, we might not even know the task, for example, so do we need to be agnostic? Uh, I think we also need to consider things like uh, with Glass, for example, that the amount of retail space that we have to display information uh, is, is very, very small. And the input as well, we're, we're looking at non-traditional forms of input, we're talking about voice uh, in that particular case. So, if we're talking about browsing the web uh, in, in, on something like Google Glass, what should we be looking to do? I think those three things come into play at that point. You were talking in, in the talk, original talk about this. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about the UX side. I need someone like Pete to tell me what the UX should be. But then, but then what worries me is how, how, do, we, how do we make sure that people can, can experiment with these things without it being a chicken and egg problem, right? We can't wait for, you know, whatever, uh, glass events with W3C specifications. 
Um, and and maybe maybe we can do this with low level APIs. Maybe we you know we can if we can address the security issues. Maybe we can give some limited raw USB access to pages. Or maybe we need something like IndieUI events, just a higher level semantic, you know, and just be able to say, hey, someone's manipulating this object by rotating it and scaling it. And how they do that on a on a watch, it, you know, mm -hmm. can be completely different from how they do it on a touch screen. And, and you know, the browser and even the page doesn't need to know. Yeah. There's yeah, also this chicken yeah. and egg problem with. You know, people want, you, you got to design for compatibility, right? Most websites out there are not going to be designed for your new watch. So you got to come up with something so that you can do a really good job for existing content will still allow some incremental uh, extension to do a little bit better for sites that are really designed for your special type of input. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree. We, we obviously talked about this uh, over the last uh, day or so as well. And uh, on, the, on the pointer events mailing list, uh, while we're working on the standard. And on the one hand, it's really good for a, a developer that we're now working on these low-level APIs. I want to get access to, you know, is it a finger or a stylus, or is it three fingers, and what are the X and Y coordinates? Uh, and that's really great that I can do that as a developer. But in most cases, if I'm developing an application, generally, I don't really care how the user's touching the touch screen, with a nose or with a finger or any other body part or any other <laughs> device, or if they're using voice. What I really want is, is usually the intent. Uh, the user intends to activate this button. The user intends to get more information or manipulate. So even though pointer events are a step in the right direction, I think they might already be a, a little step too late, because uh, now we already have like touch and, uh, and stylus and, and mouse and everything else. There's all these new interfaces. And really, we should be looking more at high-level stuff. In the UI is probably a, a good step in the right direction. It's been a bit sidelined, because it falls under the main kind of its accessibility. So, oh, it's just for blind people and stuff, so we're not going to care about it. So I would say have a look at indie UI stuff. It actually abstracts a lot of these things that in most cases, unless you are trying to create something that has a custom gesture or that really takes advantage of something that can only be done with, say, a leap motion, uh, if you really just care about the user wants to open this document or manipulate this thing or you know, resort this table, you want the intent. You don't want the actual raw bits and bobs of which key number was pressed, which key code was pressed. Because you're just going to end up in a situation later on, as a new device comes out, that you're going to have to reinvent or re-implement a whole new model, which is what we've seen with touch events. It was a great idea, but all of a sudden you got a separate model purely for touch. And then something new comes along. And instead of, uh, which, which was a really wise decision, I would say, from Microsoft, instead of then saying, OK, we're going to have stylus touch and uh, whatever else touch, you know, connect touch, they decided to abstract at least anything that's pointer-like. But it should really go a step further. It should, be, uh, it should have included keyboard, in my opinion, and just be more device agnostic in general. And, and yeah, indie UI is, is probably not perfect, but it does move towards more that idealized goal of just looking at intent rather than raw gubbins. So we've got a question. I think Chris was uh, with his first with his hand up. That simulation makes a lot of sense as well. For example, I've written a few things for, uh, uh, for Leap Motion, and instead of doing my own handlers, I just fired a click event after that. So mm -hmm. if somebody wants to build a new UI uh, that takes this in, all they have to listen is for click events. And click events are great because they're also keyboard events. So mm -hmm. instead of exactly. reinventing yeah. and putting more and more event handlers on our interfaces for all the possible things, just firing or uh, 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 generating an event that is already listened to is a simpler way in than having another library around that. Absolutely. It's like focus, blur, and click are probably the ones that, if you want to do something today that will still work in a few years' time with whatever other device is there, they're high level enough and they're abstracted enough from the actual what is the type of input that uh, it will work. The reason that things like, say, touch events and even pointer events have to fire other, you know, the, the mouse compatibility events uh, on mouse over, on mouse out, and everything else is mainly because I think we, we shot ourselves in the foot at the time when we started inventing these very device specific, uh, you know, uh, event handlers. Uh, and that's why now, uh, just to make sure that the web as it has been written and 99% of the web that's already out there, to make it actually work on any new device, uh, any new input needs to, at the UA level, fire these compatibility events, which is a shame. And we don't want to end up perpetuating this, that in five years' time, we're going to have to end up, when we're, we're using our minority report until your arms fall off kind of interactions, <laughs> that all of a sudden they have to emulate from that. It needs to emulate <coughs> pointer events, which then need to emulate mouse events, just to make sure that you keep cascading back to the old technologies. So um, just quick questions, a quick comment, sorry, from, from Ren. 
Really? Um, well, it's, it's kind of a question rather than a comment. It, um, oh? I might, <laughs> maybe I'm a caveman, but um, the, 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 the t like pointer events and touch events, I get they apply to PCs and smartphones that have browsers in them, quite often made by the, the companies that put the browser vendor on the device. Um, this watch can get a connection to the internet, but it, there's no kind of um, uh, standards on that device, and the leap motion to get it to talk to a web page requires a, something in the middle. To get the connect yeah. to talk to anything on the web requires something in the middle. And I'm, I might be missing this, but what devices are actually talking, you know, web languages, like web compatible languages? And um, if we're talking about these pointer events for these kind of or any kind of standardized event for these kind of big... Um, yeah, Firefox, Firefox, fine. Um, <laughs> we're talking about you know, minority-type, huh? <laughs> minority-report-type wow. interactions. I don't... I might be missing it, but where are the where are the devices? TVs aren't getting there. They're not. T TVs are going to fire uh, pointer events. Sorry if I'm... So we'll, Kick we'll, me we'll, if we'll, I'm we'll, dominating no, this. No, no, we'll get, we'll get on to, we'll get on to okay. some of this later, I think. So right. we're going to go to a new question. We've got... Um, Matt Andrew, with a very similar question coming up. So, but Matt Andrew. Uh, <laughs> Boring. Hi. Uh, so, this is. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> laughing at him, not you. <laughs> <laughs> this is from uh, Patrick Law. Uh, yeah. <laughs> touch events are a very simple mechanism for touch, whereas pointer events are a far more detailed abstraction. Should a browser vendor ideally implement one or the other, offer both separately, or some kind of combined model? As it's my own question, I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you think? I mean, this is a, a, must be a problem for browser vendors because you've got to support. Yeah. You either say, well, I'm going to do touch events because that's what everyone knows, and it's so yeah. easy to sort of tie it into what already happens with clicks. Yeah. And, we, and we can't stop supporting something we've already supported. And, and it's not even as easy as saying, well, on the page, we'll decide one or the other. Because you've got to make sure there's a transition path for uh, libraries that, that operate within uh, an existing document. So Google Maps, for example, right? If we said the page is either sending pointer events or touch events, then, then Google Maps could never change because you know, as soon as they switched to using point events, the whole page would be broken. Or, you know, so, so there's this difficult transition path. Um, I think Firefox is planning on supporting both touch events and pointer events. I'm, I'm really optimistic about that. Um, I'm, I'm <coughs> hopeful that uh, at some point we'll do that in Chrome as well. We, we really want to make sure that we're only going to support APIs that really last, that are lasting APIs that uh, eventually all browsers are going to support. And as long as the jury's kind of still out on whether or not all browsers are going to support it, we want to be a little bit careful to make sure we're not introducing something new that's largely redundant that ends up not standing the test of time. So we're really <coughs> looking for feedback from developers to make, you know, to make sure it's something that developers really want and intend to use for a long time. And then we'll support both. But we can never get rid of the stuff we've I mean, supported previously. So that's probably exactly my problem. So I, the UI lead on Yale.com, you know, big website. Uh, if, we break, if we break something, it's going to break it. It's going to break hard. So uh, if I were to try and convince my boss to say, OK, I want to implement pointer inter uh, interactions, it's going to say, OK, uh, that sounds great. What browser is it, is, is it supported on? I'll go IE 10 and 11, and I'll probably stop there, because that, right now, that's all that supports it. Chrome will get there, which is great. Firefox will get there, which is great. Uh, Apple, which is uh, Apple Safari, which is, uh, let's pick about 25% uh, of our user base, they probably aren't going to implement this spec. And so if I'm going to spend uh, what will take me a couple of weeks to completely tear out our interaction model and put pointer events in there instead, even pointer events within all the back polyfills in order to make it work on Safari, that's going to be a massive amount of engineering effort for something which probably isn't going to give me any benef business benefit whatsoever, uh, except that it might get rid of 300 millisecond click time, and that's going away with something else anyway. So as from an implementation standpoint and a purely business standpoint, actually selling pointer events is quite difficult. Unless you're making a Windows 8 app, in which case, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> and if you are making a Windows 8 app, please speak to me at the end of the event. Thank you. <laughs> um, you're, I mean, you're, you're doing, with HandJest, you, you, you have this problem you must be dealing with all the time, of, well, when you implement the pointer events, about having to deal with both at the same time. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, really, uh, 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 also, yeah. It's like the, when, you, when you use your use, use touch event, it sends touch and mouse right to, 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 uh, next to each other and sometimes in a different order in other browsers. So you, so you can't really uh, find out when it's like a touch or mouse. And then you have the pointer events. But uh, yeah, it, it only works like in, so in, the, in, the, in the latest Internet Explorer versions. 
and yeah, yeah. I don't. It's 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 hard to. Uh, yeah, I think we. Yeah. I, I was looking at the, just like the the, the triage of the, the of all the different events that happen when a touch happens on the scr screen. I mean, you must you must live this. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> Stuff happens, and yeah. you have to put it in there because of legacy behaviours and so forth. It's extraordinarily mm -hmm. complex. Yeah. Um, how how do you how do you how do you work around that sort of complexity? Who whose heads it in? <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, I mean, we've got to do a better job of documenting it, right? I, I think you know. I think there's a question coming up about this, but you know, we I think the touch event standard didn't really document any of this stuff. It was all done retroactively to try to take, you know, the majority of, of what the existing implementations had done. And you know, and, and I, 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 when I realized two years ago that touch event standard didn't have anyone from Google on it, that I realized there was a problem there. It was all like retroactively trying to document what had been done without trying to. Inst the po real point of standards is to get the rationality in there from the start. Right? So. Um, hopefully, I think we're doing a better job with pointer events. We just define pretty precisely, and then Patrick came along and said, "I, just, I don't understand this. <laughs> Let me write an example and show. Here's the exact thing you should expect." Okay. Um, I think that's that's the way forward. We've got to do some of this stuff for compatibility, but hopefully, we can rely on layers on top to to make it simpler. So your UI framework, hopefully, will will say on this UI framework, you just got to deal with the events it generates, and you don't need to worry about different browsers and their old compatibility modes and what the differences are between IE and Safari, um, and you know I. Hopefully, we can smooth a lot of this over with frameworks. Yeah. Now, now I think uh, a lot of the complexity they get nowadays is uh, coming from the fact that we've made bad design, design decisions in the past. I mentioned already you know, the on mouse over, on mouse out, and everything else, which is the reason why touch events need to fire mouse compatibility events. Because we, as developers, were told years ago, to do a hover effect, you just do an on mouse over. And we've all been taking it and you know, cargo culting it around. And now that content is there, it's set in stone, and these new devices need to use that. If we could start afresh, uh, you know, we, we'd, we'd change it. But the reality is uh, we are living with both that legacy content and we're moving towards a, a multi-input uh, world. I mean, already now we've got devices. A few years ago, it was unheard of to think, oh, you might have a laptop that also has a touch screen. Touch surely means it's a mobile, or then it was, or it's a tablet. And now it means... Uh, the fact that you get touchscreen uh, event means there is a touchscreen. It doesn't say anything further. And that's the fire alarm test. Yeah, Thank sorry. To, there is a fire alarm test which we Attention couldn't avoid please. today. Attention. The public address and fire alarm systems are about to be tested. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love Do we have your attention? The message will sound first. Followed by the evacuation message. Right, okay. Should we just run around and panic? Do not take any further action. <laughs> no action! <laughs> what if a fire breaks out <laughs> while there is a test? No one start a fire! <laughs> we didn't start the fire, it was always oh. burning. Attention. Oh. An incident has been reported within the building. I repeat, Oof. it hasn't been. <laughs> announcements. Right. <laughs> it's like space invaders. What's going on? This is good though. Right? Yeah. Attention, please. Yeah. Attention, please. Uh huh. We have an emergency. An emergency. Double plus good. It's not just an incident anymore. Yeah. We've got. Us. This is escalating. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe something is going on. And now. The test is now complete. Yes. There you go. <laughs> hey. <laughs> that last bit at the end was Martin. brilliant. <laughs> that last bit at the end was brilliant. If you have problems hearing this, please alert someone. <laughs> <laughs> Accessibility, but we'll yeah. talk about that next. So yeah, I can't remember where I was. But yeah, yeah. We're, we are in a multi-input world. Well, if you can't remember, let's just oh, go thanks. to a new topic. Thanks. <laughs> Danny Croft. Subtle way Danny Croft. Um, do you have a new topic? <laughs> because we have no idea where we are now. <laughs> Um, are pointer events uh, overcomplicating touch interactions? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'd, I'd like to echo no. <laughs> We've got seven minutes of this, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, they. Oh, sorry. Go on. <laughs> yeah, I'm aware of that, and it probably sounds like quite a good idea. Also, <laughs> really, really tell the people which got the fire alarms, please don't do it. No. Anyway. So, yeah, but I, I mean, it, 
Are they overcomplicated? There is an argument, though, from a developer point of view. I'm playing the devil's advocate here, obviously, not talking about half of my own. As a real developer. <laughs> as, a de as a developer's, from a developer's point of view, it is, it is quite a complex thing. Yeah. But, but is, it, is it better to kind of, with touch events, you kind of, we papered over the cracks of we needed touch, we kind of got it in there. Um, I think with, with pointer events, we took a step back and we looked at, well, what are all the different types of uh, interactions that could happen on a device, realistic interactions that could happen on a device? Um, I mean, is that, I think, is that, is, 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 are we making too much of it, though? Because it's all good on paper, this abstraction, but is it too much of a complicated abstraction? I, I think if you think of devices like strictly like you've got tablets and you've got laptops, then, then maybe you could make an argument that says pointer events is overcomplicating it. But, but Microsoft believes that that's not the only two kind of devices we're going to have. And you know, we believe that at Google as well. Um, and that we need to be prepared for you know, devices that are a hybrid and, and, and like there's a continuum between them. And then the complexity of having touch events and mouse events on these kind of devices is really high. Like you probably don't realize the extent to which touch events implicitly capture to where you start touching and mouse events uh, don't capture at all. And, and the implication that has for when you remove a DOM element that is in your event chain somewhere. You know, there's very subtle bugs that mm. result kind of from these differences where pointer events unifies it all and says there's one model. If you can, you don't need to worry about any of these old things. Just target this new mm. model. Absolutely. The, com uh, the complication <coughs> comes from when you try and add things on top of uh, pointer events. So if you, say, were to look at the TVs and you were trying to add the, uh, the D-pad into that, which it currently doesn't do, then you're trying to fire two models. And that's where you kind of get into much more complication, uh, complicated stuff. I mean, uh, if you're still thinking about uh, the polyfills and everything, Hammer.js solves pretty much all of that for you. So it's just when you're adding more and more things on top. And as we've touched on already, if you're trying to add voice onto the top as well, you're, also, uh, you're trying to have a UI that uh, reacts to probably far too many things. And that's when it gets pretty much overly complicated. Mm. Well, well, I think with, with pointer events, the nice thing is, no, it doesn't overcomplicate it. It actually simplifies it in yeah. most situations. Because <coughs> already with touch events, if you wanted to properly separate it, you'd have to listen for you know, the normal mouse events, and which work in a certain way. And then you'd have to also listen to touch events, which work in a slightly different way, because Apple couldn't be asked to just do something that's a bit standardized and had to invent their own little things and then not standardize it and then threaten people with patents uh, about it. Uh, and instead with, uh, yeah, <laughs> OK, OK. Anybody from Apple here? Uh, Whereas with pointer events, it, the, the sanity is kind of returned. It uses something, it extends mouse events. So any of your code that you wrote already for mouse just works uh, in 90% in of the cases. And as, again, as a developer, if you don't really care how the user pressed on something, activated a button, whether it is with a finger or a stylus or a mouse or whatever, if it's Xbox uh, One, whether they use the, uh, the, the joy pads or the you know, Kinect kind of touch thing, or even voice, I believe, it, it will just fire the same uh, event that says this button was activated. So it, it unifies it. However, if you want to know explicitly this was actually caused by a finger or a stylus or a mouse, there is a way of reading the attribute of that event that was passed on. So that's the, what's been extended. So it gives you the best of both worlds. You can write completely. Uh, to a certain extent, completely agnostic, input agnostic code, and just forget about it. And hopefully, if new types of devices come along that also use pointer events, they will just work rather than, oh, I've only got mouse and touch, now I need to have X. Uh, and if you do want to do something very specific, it still allows you to do that. So I think it, it, it's a good compromise. It's not perfect. As I said, keyboard, for instance, you still have to handle that separately or just go for high-level uh, events, again, focus, blur, and click. But it's a, at least a step in the right direction, and it's a more sane than inventing something similar to touch events, but now just for stylus. OK, so we, we have a, a question from the floor. Uh, yes. Uh, so Apple's touch uh, API has a really, really nice property that uh, the DOM element that received touch start will always see the touch end event. And pointer events seem to have regressed to the previous mouse down, mouse up situation, where it's very easy to miss the mouse up <coughs> if the pointer just ends up being outside the element. Uh, is there a plan to 
have a, an easier, less complicated way for pointer events for catching the uh, up event. So first of all, the, the property you're talking about touch events isn't quite as simple as, as you alluded to. I think the way you worded it is actually incorrect. It's not true that the event that received the touch start will receive the touch end. The, the element that you touched on receives the touch start. You might have an ancestor that's actually listening for the event handler and receives the event. And then if the DOM tree underneath that ancestor gets moved, this, the ancestor will never see the touch end. And you'll be surprised. And I've seen this bug in practice, and people are really surprised by it. And it's one of the disadvantages of this implicit capture model is that the programmer hasn't told the browser what element it really wants to capture the events to. It's, uh, the browser just says, well, you started touching here, so clearly that's the element that wants it, even though it's really your handler further up that really cares about the event stream. Um, so Pointer Events has an explicit API, API called Set Pointer <coughs> Capture that lets you say, if, if what you want is to track the finger no matter what's underneath it, then you call Set Pointer Capture and tell it, here's the element that I want to receive all the events for as long as this finger's down. Um, and so it is one more step, but it's, it's at least explicit. I think it's a better model, especially because it's the exact same model. It builds on top of the exact same model we're used to with mouse. You still get you know, pointer enter, pointer leave events that you can still say, well, if the user dragged their finger off, it's, you, know, you just have to remember to watch for leaving as well as ending. OK. Um, I've got one question. Natasha Rooney. Hey, so you guys have mentioned a couple of these things, so it's a sort of overall question about you know, what might become mainstream. So D-pads, TV screens, and multiple users interacting on a single screen are all scenarios we currently consider non-traditional. Which of these will become mainstream most quickly, and why do you think that? Which we came with? This is, this is kind of, well, I thought all it was the same question you had, <laughs> Um It's, you know, what, what we always talk about these new devices and these modern, uh, you know, minority report devices, but you know, they haven't got a great market share. Like, which ones do you think are going to become mainstream? If, if I knew, I think our standardization job would be so much easier. We would just say, here's the future. Let's design an API. Let's patent it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Awkward. <laughs> I'm allowed now. I don't work for a browser anymore. So. But it's because we don't know that, that we have to rely on the community to innovate and experiment, try new things, and, and see what becomes popular. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I really want massive touchscreens to be popular. I think there's a real possibility when you have like 80 inch touchscreens, 100 points of touch. I think that's really cool. The collaborative web experience that could, could happen. I mean, Leap Motion. Mm -hmm. What do you think about Leap Motion? Do you, like do you think it's ever become mainstream? I mean, the problem I have with Leap Motion is it doesn't really solve an issue. Mm -hmm. In that, <laughs> <laughs> if, I'm te if I'm like 10 centimeters away from a screen, right? I can touch it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if, with the connect, you're, like, you're 10 meters away. There's a, there's a, a sol you're solving a problem, but you know. Yeah. OK. <laughs> well, we've got some waves. Uh, but I'm not here to debate the, the validity of the leap motion. I think it's got a lot of great things that it, you can't do with touch, like depth, for example, and, and being able to kind of zoom in and out of things, which I think are, are unique to that particular uh, type of input. Um, what else would you like me to say on that matter? <laughs> what do you think, what other devices do you think are going to come out which are, is there anything which you think which actually genuinely is going to come kind of mainstream, which is that's maybe right. voice. I mean, is, that's not really, it's kind of mainstream on, on well, native devices, but on the web, yeah. it's, it's demo yeah. work. Uh, vo uh, voice is getting there, but the way of voice is actually getting somewhere is the, the Google Now stuff. So mm. if you're seeing the Google Wear stuff this week, um, and uh, if you've ever played with Google Glass, the voice <laughs> commands are by far the best part of it. And now that's starting to make its way onto native Android hardware, um, <coughs> through the kind of the whole OK Google thing, that's working. That's starting to work really well. And with the Xbox One as well, it's getting there. It's not quite right yet, mm -hmm. but it will get there. So actually, the voice uh, voice input is going to start being important. On the web, you're trying to use the same kind of APIs underneath, but you don't really want to talk to your computer. It's more of a user experience thing. Should I put so, a question uh, just for a minute? Yeah. Just for a minute. Sorry, just with regards to actually, I was going to try and project with um, what Remy brought up earlier with regards to where these kind of devices, with regards to that require custom gestures and things like that. I'm actually quite in a unique position because I actually know exactly where they are and they're mainstream right now, and that's a thing called digital out of home. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, it's basically any digital display you see that's an advert out on the street in the underground, things like that, that's an industry. Digital at home, I'm experienced with it, and there's a huge amount of money going into that, and that's actually a symptom of how capable Chrome is. Chrome is actually, and to a lesser extent the other browsers, but for some reason Chrome's managed to capture it, is the actual platform that's driving a lot of that. Basically, a lot of those displays, if they're ever interactive, are basically a web browser screen. Mm -hmm. And there's actually direct, 
implications there why you do need to come up with new gestures. So that's things like you know where the Hammer.js kind of comes in because as a tangible example, when you have a device that you're swiping left or right with, if it's a display on your phone or like actually a small device, you swipe left or right with one finger. If you actually have a large touch changing screen, you walk up to it, you swipe with two fingers. We've actually noticed that people do it, they don't realize they're doing it, but that actually right there is somewhere where actually you now the format of because it's out in the world and it's actually a large screen, you now have to change the way you're capturing gestures. And if you're ever doing things with regards to installations and things like kiosks and you have them a lot of in kind of like trade shows where you have like you know the digital displays, they have games, they're capturing weird interaction events. They're all powered by the browser. Um, and the advertising industry, I mean, that's today. That's not like a weird thing that's coming. Like, I'm not kidding, where I work, like every single month we have things like that going on. And then we're kind of building these things. So you know, with, with something like kiosks, though, and, and kind of installations, that's not mainstream. That's not consumer technology in the web sense, really, is it? I mean, we're using it definitely as consumers. Well, but this, not yeah, that's the thing. The technology has moved into this non-web scenario. But like, if you take, for example, the, the Crosswell TV ad network, which is like the visual displays you get on the underground, some of those now are actually Wi-Fi mobile enabled with your phone. You can actually get out and through the web medium interact with the display. Is you're using web technologies, but you're not on the web, but actually you're now passively you know, interacting with, you're now using gestures on your phone to control a big display. So um, with that, I think there's an awful lot learned in terms of we should perhaps talk a lot more. Yeah. We should. Yeah. We should talk yeah. a lot more. Let's about take over the next standardization. Session. I think it's really good actually in, in this point. So there's, there's now a lot of collaboration which is happening in, the, in the touch events uh, groups and so forth. And there's a lot to learn. I don't think anyone really knows there's the answer to a lot of the questions that we're asking. Some, some of these are, are, we're going to figure out as new devices, which will become mainstream one day, Ram. Uh, <laughs> never. No. Um, so I want to just thank my panel and uh, thank all of you for listening. We're going to have a break now. That's all right.